Welcome to the Get Published Podcast, sponsored by Birdie Consulting Group. To get more information about our coaching, publishing, executive ghostwriting, and podcast production services, go to getpublishedpodcast.com. Hello, I am Paul Brody, and thank you for joining us for another episode of the Get Published Podcast, where we help authors get published with a proven system that works. Today, we're being joined by Joya Wesley, author of Learning from Greensboro. Joya, welcome to the show. Good morning, Paul. Thank you so much for your invitation. Are you ready to get started? I am ready. All right, question number one. What is the one piece of advice that you would give to a first-time author who is currently writing their book? I would tell them to get some help. And I mean that in two different ways, not just in the self-serving way, since I personally am a ghostwriter and I've helped authors who felt like they were not writers do the writing for them basically an interviewing process and I've also worked as a developmental editor where I'm able to help people conceptualize their books and get them clear about the outline. My dad actually published a book called Hit Me Fred, Recollections of a Sideman. He's a trombone player, used to be James Brown's band leader. And people, since I'm a writer by training, I studied writing and was a journalist, people often imply or in or um, assume that I wrote the book. They said, did you you write that book? And I said, no, I didn't. He really wrote it. He's an excellent storyteller. I thought I was the writer in the family until that book came out. Excellent storyteller. It's hilarious. But what I did do was help him create an outline. We worked together to create the outline, and then he wrote to the outline. So that was very helpful. So if people don't want to do that or don't feel they need to do that, they're writing themselves. The other way I mean get some help is to get an accountability partner. This I found very helpful personally because now for the first time I've done all of this utility writing, I like to call it. I was a freelance. I am a freelance writer. I do annual reports and web copy and brochure copy and that kind of thing. But it's not until recently that I began, I've began. i begun writing my own book, which is a spiritual memoir slash travelogue slash inspirational guide. But I was talking to someone about it, another writer, and he came to me and he said, oh, well, I'm looking for an accountability partner. And I didn't, didn't know what that was. I hadn't really heard that concept. But when he said it, I thought, oh, I could... I could use that too. That sounds really good. So we created a partnership and what we do is we talk each day and we report on our progress and we pray if that's your thing, that's been helpful for me. If it's not your thing, you don't have to add that part, but just the um, accountability is very helpful for keeping a book project moving I've found so that's my my biggest piece of advice is not try to go it alone get some help in whatever way makes the most sense for you and I couldn't agree more with you I think having an accountability partner is critical or having a coach Mm -hmm. or having a guide or just having someone to help you with that process so you're not just doing it all yourself you have someone that you do have to report to and it's even better than just reporting to yourself when you have someone else that you can trust that you have a good relationship with and then you get to help them to support on the other side it's just such a great way to get your book moving and to get it done exactly yes yes and i love that you mentioned yeah. on ghost writing too because Funny thing is, I was always asked by clients if I provide ghostwriting. And I always said, no, mm-hmm. it's not my thing. Not, you know, it's not really a good fit. And then this epiphany happened a few weeks ago where I actually decided to offer ghostwriting as part of our services. But what I realized mm-hmm. was I can't help everyone ghostwrite. It's just it's not a fit because you have different um different types of books you have your fiction books you have your memoir type of books i'm like okay what is my best fit and i realized it was business owners and executives helping them because this is what i didn't realize i was already doing that for the last several years i just didn't realize it was actually ghostwriting (laughs) okay okay yeah that's great that's great that makes it a higher price point (laughs) the services wise i imagine 
Well, and it just helps get the story out. I think that's the Mm -hmm. biggest thing is just helping them as the guide because I always thought it was so much more complicated. And really, ghostwriting comes down to having good conversations. As you mentioned, getting the stories out and utilizing that Q&A format and just making sure that everything is documented in the conversation where you can get it transcribed because that really is the main method in regards to especially with non-fiction and and with business books because obviously fiction that's a whole different ball game right that i don't have experience with except now i'm actually editing a young adult um novel which is really exciting and i have some things to say about that in a future question (laughs) so you can go all right well speaking of future questions let's talk about the hardest part about getting published so what do you feel is the hardest part about getting published well what's been hard to me or felt hard to me is the the actual getting published getting a publisher or creating a publishing plan building the community and market to sell the book which is a key part of that and uh, to that end, I thank God for people like you, Paul Brody, and for your book and for your your system and for your offering of of these these tips, these tools, this this help in that regard because that is the hardest part. And I am looking forward to learning more about that because I haven't um, actually done it. I talked with a an agent about my the book I'm working on and felt momentarily discouraged when she was telling me, oh, well, how many followers do you have and how how big is your community and what's your market like that you've built for your book? And I was like, I haven't, I haven't done any of that. I don't know how to do that. I don't know. I don't know. So to make contact with you has been really a godsend, exactly what I needed. And I am so grateful and I encourage everybody to make use of resources like the ones you provide. Well, Joy, I, I definitely appreciate the kind words with that. Um, I will tell you as well, I had um, we were doing a recording for a show yesterday, and we had a lady on the show. She was just phenomenal, but she went down, she tried to do everything herself with her book. And then instead mm-hmm. of hiring the right people, she actually hired some people that just mainly focused on PR. And she just had a terrible time with it. And prior to the call, um, she told me, it's like, hey, this is going to be a very frank interview. And I was like, great. Mm. Those are my favorite type of conversations where I can help people walk through the process. And we had a very candid conversation. And some of the main things I was talking about was what you mentioned with having a plan, having a system, and most importantly, having a system that has been used for years and it actually works and that you work with someone that you know you like and you can trust them and know that they're getting the job done because i think that's one of the biggest challenges as well is finding the right people to work with whether that's someone like me or someone else i think the main question that you have to ask a prospective publisher is what are your core values and how are you going to be able to support me during the launch because with the exception of penguin and random house just about every other publisher expects you to do the marketing of your book. And that, that's what you're talking about when they're asking about your platform. Yeah. And that's just such a huge eye opener. And probably the number one thing that I've learned with 170 plus episodes we've done on the show is the fact that yeah. they expect you to do the marketing for your book, whether you're public, where you're going the traditional route or if you choose to go the indie route. Yeah. Yeah, that was a shock for me. I was like, what? No, I haven't done that. I'm the publisher to do that. And it was a rude awakening that publishers definitely generally don't do that, like you just said. So, yeah, but it was a, a, um, a comforting discovery that, 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 there are, that there is help out there. There are resources available to make that marketing platform building sales well part happen and these transitions have been great we've been talking about because it literally is going right into the next area and that of course is about marketing so please share a marketing strategy that you have used in your book launch that works well yes well i i thought when i first saw that question that i don't have any marketing strategies i don't know anything about that but i do I'm learning from Greensboro, which I co-authored with a wonderful human rights attorney named Lisa Magarell and was published by University of Pennsylvania Press. 
part of the success of that is that it was it was written with the intention of being a resource for communities that were engaged in truth and reconciliation work. I don't know if you know about truth and reconciliation, but in South Africa, after apartheid Mm -hmm. ended, the reason there was not the the retaliatory bloodbath that many people were afraid of was because Nelson Mandela and his community and their wisdom Bishop Desmond Tutu, who I had the pleasure of meeting two times, knew that you can't just leave people to their own devices to to heal from traumatic histories. And Lisa was working for an organization, my co-author, um, called the International Center for Transitional Justice, and it was devoted to helping communities a lot in South America who had been through coups and that kind of thing, where when you're moving forward from that and you want to create a democratic system that has justice and equality built into it, you have to be very thoughtful about doing that. And the idea of a Truth and Reconciliation Commission is that you get people with impeccable integrity who the community can agree will be honest and fair and smart and you get general community people to come tell their stories so that you get the stories out like you were talking about in a book and this process is also about getting the stories out and then you do research and study and you create a um, plan for moving forward with with justice and with reconciliation where people can be um, can feel good about their leadership, their government, their neighbor, and have a brighter future otherwise. So since the book was written for communities, it was a resource at communi- for communities. And one of the things we did was target groups like classes for example a lot of um um justice government law classes use the book as a as a textbook and um uh, communities like like the, the people who were spearheading truth and reconciliation projects were the groups that we aimed toward so similarly, I'm editing a young adult novel now, a, a, a Christian young adult novel, and the guy, the author, is targeting youth groups. So he wants to offer it as a um, resource. It's a novel. It's very entertaining. There's, there's running and shooting and parties and adolescent love and all the things that students and youth groups are experiencing, but to use it as a tool, a teaching tool, so that people can read it and talk about it and learn from it. And another project I've been involved with, a book called The Breakthrough Boot Camp, which is a a process of um, prayer and self-hypnosis for breaking through in any 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 areas of life but it similarly has a group component where it can be used in groups where you have accountability partners and people facilitate each other through these different practices to use to to break through barriers that are keeping you from feeling like you're living your best life as Oprah would say so um, and, and another friend of mine whose book I, I served as a developmental editor called Sweet Tips from Lola's Lips, an inspirational book, also targeted book groups. So I think targeting groups and finding ways that your book can be a resource for communities of people, classes of people, clubs of people, book clubs, I think that's that's a um, strategy that that works. It worked with learning from Greensboro and I think it works with other books. So that's, that's what came to my mind being a a marketing newbie basically, but that was something that I think can be helpful to other authors. 
Yeah, and those are all great strategies. And I love how you're able to have the book potentially um, have it as essentially required reading at universities. Yeah. I mean, that's amazing. Yeah, that was great. We were really excited about that. And that's that's probably the biggest sales we had was through universities. And it was a university press, so that was the idea in actually publishing it. So, yeah. And and I think a lot of other books lend themselves to that. And and um, my dad's book, The Hit Me Fred, really is a great resource for young musicians and people in the music business. And also it has great... Um, stories so it's a lot of history in it too about being on the road as a black musician he's with James Brown in the 60s and 70s and um, how the music business evolved from singles singles were the thing in the in the 50s in the early part of the 60s when James Brown had I feel good and Papa's got a brand new bag and those kinds of songs but then when my dad started working as his band leader the um record label Polydor signed a deal with James Brown to do five albums and James Brown didn't know anything about albums and my dad didn't know anything about albums but he was able to learn and he found people in New York um, arrangers and copyists and contractors who helped him find the greatest musicians in town and he was able to create some really magical music using the top musicians in New York City and all of that um, learning is chronicled in his book, so it's it's a great textbook too. But yeah, when people are trying to learn, books are great. Like you were saying, business books, business um, skills and strategies are very useful. And when people are working them together, it makes them even more useful, and it sells more books. Well, what would be the main strategies that you would suggest to our listeners to be able to potentially have their book? turned into a textbook to have required reading with these universities. Is there, are there any specific strategies that you would suggest in terms of reaching out and building those relationships with the schools? Um, I don't, I don't have any, but I think when you're writing, if you write with that goal in mind, then I think that would shape the story and shape the book in a way that would position it to be used in that way and and um just work with what you know friends of friends there's somebody i'll bet you know teaching a course somewhere (laughs) who could work in your um your book if they wanted to if it was really good and really useful so that's that's what i think work the connections you have that might not seem like they're not they're not the, the provost of stanford university but they might be a adjunct professor there who knows that the information in your book is useful and um, wants to help spread it. So one at a time, one person at a time, one group at a time, one class at a time. Excellent. Well, thank you for sharing that. And let's talk about your favorite book. So what is your favorite book and what was the number one thing that you learned from it? My favorite book is a novel called The Duppy by a Jamaican novelist named Anthony Winkler. And if you don't know, I don't know if you're a reggae fan, Bob Marley has a song called Duppy Conqueror. Jamaicans, in in Jamaican kind of Creole patois, a duppy is a ghost. So the book is about this shopkeeper who dies and goes to heaven and meets God and God looks like a firefly and he flies around with them and they get to be friends with he it's it's this whole philosophy of of life story done in this parable ish kind of novel that is so hilarious. There were there were times I've read it like four times because it's like some of my favorite entertainment. There were times when I had to put the book down and just laugh and cry laugh until I cried and then have to wipe my eyes and get myself back together to continue reading because it's it's so funny so the thing I learned from that is the power of humor so I'm I'm trying to be funny in my book without being too um too over the top or too stilted about it but humor is so powerful so these these um principles that are featured in the book are 
driven into me even more powerfully than they would be by a, a minister or a spiritual teacher because it's so funny. So humor is a powerful tool, and that's what I learned from this, my favorite book. And for our final question, what is your favorite quote and why? Okay, my favorite quote, or one of my favorite quotes, one that's been with me a long time, and I don't know the source of it. It might be, it was anonymous. I had it on a plaque that I got from a discount store called Pick and Save in Los Angeles before I went to college. And it is, what you are is God's gift to you, and what you make of yourself is your gift to God. And the reason I love it is because it highlights the the co-creation that I believe is going on in this life where you're 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 born with a set of gifts and talents and that's the raw material you use to create a life and create a person who is influencing other people's lives. And it's an ongoing process, it never ends and it's a joy to be a part of and I'm grateful to be a part of. I love that quote, the two, the circular thing. It's not just a taking, it's a giving and a receiving. Well, Joy, I want to thank you for being a guest on the show. What is the best way for people to find you online? They can find me at www.roadmama.com. Road, R-O-A-D-M-A-M-A. It's a nickname I picked up from my um, tour management work. I've been managing my dad and his band for the past 11 years, and I have a bunch of grown children. They're actually geriatric, all of them, but they call me Road Mama. So that's my site, and that's where you can find me and email me from there. It's under construction. It's brand, brand new, but I saw you were going to ask me the question, so I put something there. So thank you. Well, Joy, I want to thank you once again for being on the show, and I wish you all the best in your author journey ahead. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much for your work, for the resources you've created, and for inviting me. I wish you all the best, too. Thanks again for joining us today. To learn more about how you can be featured in our brand new Get Published business book, go to getpublishedpodcast.com.